Alright everybody, welcome. Welcome back to the channel. Back to uh, That Heathen Bastard. And uh, remember, this is not a news show. This is a channel for talking points. It's a political platform. N your, your best news sources will be Tim Pool uh, for news, or the Black Conservative's Perspective for news, or Six Hex and Hammer 666 for analysis. Or m and many other independent journalists. With that being said, let's begin. Now, today's talking point is going to be something that I know people are going to really shit their pants over, but I want to talk about it. You know, because I love being controversial, don't you? It's just so much fun to uh, gain people's irrational anger towards you and their ire. Because that, generally speaking, that means you know you're on to something, that you're doing something right. At least in my mind, anyway. Uh, <laughs> anyway, today... I'm going to talk about how pro-choicers are basically just unwitting eugenicists. And if you're not familiar with what that means, unwitting it means that you're that you don't know what you're that you don't really know what you're doing. You're unwittingly aiding someone. You are unwittingly engaging in eugenics without realizing you're engaging in eugenics when you get an abortion. You are engaging in a eugenicist historically eugenicist behavior. Now, first, I'm going to talk about eugenics. Eugenics, in a nutshell, came from the idea that, um, essentially, the genetic reality in regards to race was something that could be and should be manipulated. Manipulated, modified, controlling genes, breeding, breeding in or breeding out specific characteristics. Uh, they practiced eugenics first on dogs, and that is what created many of the various dog breeds. They were manipulating something very real. And while they did get many of the benefits they wanted, there are many side effects with breeding dog breeds. You have br dogs who can barely bre who can barely breathe because the shape of their nasal and airway cavities are such that they can hardly breathe. And the bulldog is so hugely inbred that it's sort of a night that it's sort of a nightmare puppy. Now imagine if they went ahead with eugenics on people. <laughs> and what the result of that would have been. Eventually, we would have wound up like that bulldog. That horribly inbred bulldog. Or many other fucked up dog species. Eugenics was a bad idea. Because when we started messing around with genes and DNA, we were messing with forces beyond our understanding. And this is what I don't like about some people in the scientific field, is their, uh, their desire and their tendency to just mess around with shit that they probably shouldn't be messing with, you know? Yeah, you know, take it to one step, one step at a time. Take it slow, there, Junior. You're gonna cause problems. Yeah, you know, look what you did to dogs. You want to do that to people? I didn't think so. But eugenics is also extremely relevant to uh, racism, and in particular, the Nazis had a eugenics program. Uh, they bleached children's hair to try and make it as blonde as possible. They tried adding uh, coloring to their eyes, to contacts to make them blue. They tried eliminating any and all characteristics uh, that were not seen as Northern Germanic, which Hitler saw as um, as perfect and appropriate. You basically have to look and feel like a Scandinavian, or you're not really the master race, you know. The funny thing is that there, there is no master race. Some would argue there is no race at all, but that's scientifically errant. Right? There are genes that control your melanin level. It's the same gene in each race, but it controls a different level of melanin for a different level of melanin. Melanin is demonstrable. Race does exist. But there is no master race. There is no one that is objectively superior. In fact, I would argue that uh, objective superiority doesn't even exist. Right? It's conditional superiority or subjective superiority. You may be superior to someone in one setting. Like, if you wrestle a bear, we both know who's going to win. The bear. But if you challenge to a man, a man and a bear to a math test, we know who's going to win. The man. Right? It's relative. It's subjective. It's relative superiority. Is the only re demonstrable reality there. But the Nazis were not really into demonstrable reality. They were into a romantic vision of a perfect, uh, untouchable, godly, you know, version of humanity. 
which is just one of the most insane ideas I've heard in my life. And they were basically aiming to achieve that with eugenics. The eugenics program didn't only uh, involve messing with genes and messing with uh, expressed characteristics, it also involved killing undesirables, especially in the womb. The Nazis aborted undesired babies and even Jewish babies. They don't talk about it as much, but it did happen. Abortion is a eugenics technique. Now, this is the thing about eugenics and how it relates to defects in the womb. Eugenics, the goal is to create a, an ideal, perfect version of a race of humans, whether it's white or it's black or whatever. Sometimes it's used to just wipe out entire races of people altogether, or uh, attempts at genocide. Uh, and defects in the womb are one of the first things they want to remove from the, from the race, from the gene pool. Children who are born deformed, they're born lame, they're born with crooked spines, they're born with um, physical and possibly mental deformities. What they would have labeled as defects such as autism or Down syndrome, or even scoliosis or something of that nature, which is being born with a crooked spine, uh, would be seen as defects and that baby, the minute they detect it, boom, abortion. They abort the, defe the defective child in order to perfect the race. There are people who think this way. Uh, there was an, uh, there, there was and possibly is still a epidemic of parents in Sweden aborting children the minute they find their child has Down syndrome. Essentially engaging in open eugenics. Which is not as much of a taboo in that part of the world. It's more of a taboo in Central Europe, uh, in Southern Germanic uh, cultures and in the Western culture in the United States because eugenics of a form was attempted here. They attempted to uh, eugen eugen they attempted eugenics projects on Native Americans. It's something that you don't hear about as much. It's pretty hor horrifying to hear about. Now, uh, They also like to go after neuroatypicalness in the womb, as I've mentioned. And a neuro, being neuroatypical means that you, uh, you, your brain is wired differently from the typical person. If you're an, if you're an Aspie or if you're on the um, autistic spectrum, your brain's wired differently. Right, and they don't see that as being a very viable either. That's something to be eliminated. Excuse me. With eugenics... You were essentially supposed to eliminate it once and for all, no matter what. And generally speaking, to explain it for those of you who may not be fully uh, capable of understanding, uh, I'll just simplify it for you. I'll just simplify it for you. Uh, to be uh, uh, to be an Aspie, to be Aspergers, basically your brain is sort of wired like a like the brain of a bureaucrat. Everything's got to be systematized and organized. Everything's got to be exactly the way you want it. And if anything falls out of line, like for for an, for an Aspie child, it can be very distressing. The, the, their their normal order has been disrupted. And if so, and if they see you disrupt their order, they're like, "How dare you disrupt my order?" Yeah, you know, it's an unusual like psycho deeply rooted psychological desire to have everything perfectly organized to the will of the. Uh, of the Aspie, and there's difficulty making eye contact because it's stressful, right? Because that level of intimacy is more than than uh, Aspies are able to handle, and I and I know because I am an Aspie, right? I I do not handle really direct contact that well. I find it intimidating, even if you're not trying to intimidate. You have to understand that you basically are intimidating, even if you're not intending to. And, you know, and, and so forth. And Asperger, um, autists, autistic people are similar to Aspies. They're considered part of a, something of a continuum. And these traits are um, generally seen as bad by the eugenicists. So obviously if they found an Aspie child or a autistic child, abortion. Might even be one of these quote-unquote post-birth abortions, a.k.a. murdering babies, infanticide, 
yeah, as you can see, the vision of abortion and eugenics is pretty dismal. It's pretty dismal, uh, to put it politely. I've already discussed uh, Sweden and the abortion of Down syndrome children. I'm not really certain why that is such a trend there. I suspect it's probably little more than just uh, ableists being uh, discriminating against uh, d disabled people or, or handicapped people or people who are not uh, physically or neurally typical. I don't know what's going on with you, Sweden, but uh, there's some fucked up shit going on with you. There's some really fucked up shit going on with you. And to be honest with you, when it comes to uh, Germanic cultures, whether it's southern or northern, there's a lot with Sweden that's kind of wrong. There's a lot with Sweden that's kind of wrong. Like the fact that in Sweden in the 70s, they tried to do a wealth tax. Uh, and it was a pretty heavy wealth tax. And what ended up happening is they moved all their money offshore into offshore bank accounts. And then just left the country. The rich did. And as a result, the GDP just tanked. Because the problem is, is that the wealth are, the wealthy are always going to see wealth taxes as a form of attack. There's no talking them out of it. You don't make progress by fighting against people. Uh, you make progress working with people, right? You uh, compromise and you water down. You give them some breathing room. It is not enough to uh, tax the hell out of them. But maybe if you do something similar to that that is less severe, like a smaller tax, or maybe no tax increase and instead uh, use something to encourage them to share more of their wealth with others. Or just let it be. Because who, who, what, what, what business is yours how much money someone has anyway, honestly? But yeah, Sweden is like that. It's It has a very... It's not quite a truly socialist country, but it has socialistic leanings for sure. And there is a disturbing trend of people of the socialist bent having ties or connections with the idea of abortion and also occasionally ideas similar to or related to eugenics, i.e. saying, we don't want Down syndrome children because that's bad, you know. And honestly, when it comes right down to it, this topic is going to trigger cognitive dissonance in, in progressives. And I've noticed that progressives, that many progressives are riddled with cognitive dissonance because they've accepted an ideology that denies objective reality. Because objective reality feels bad. It's, the, it's, a, it's sort of the religion of my feels, right? They, they ignore demonstrative reality and they focus on, hmm, how does this feel to me? That's more true of leftists, who are the more extreme cousins of the progressives. And you can always tell them apart by, by um, whether or not they use right-wing as a pejorative statement, or if they take it to the level of extremism, like they want to do extremism violence, like Antifa, for example. Like Antifa or BLM. Those are leftists. Progressives are more peaceful, generally. They try to be PPR, peaceful, persuasive, respectful. It doesn't really work because they miss out on that last part. Uh, there's plenty of progressives who are truly PPR, but some fail on the R and only get the PP. And even then, that the second P of persuasive is... So they're just peaceful, basically. They're just P. <laughs> but uh, they generally try that, and I respect them for that attempt. But a lot of the time, progressives are moral reprobates. They're bad arguers. And they're riddled with cognitive dissonance, which if you don't know, cognitive dissonance is when a person's thinking uh, comes into contradiction with something that is demonstrable. Like Luke Skywalker, for example, in Empire Strikes Back, Darth Vader says, I am your father. And then he says, no, that's not true. That's cognitive dissonance. You were thinking one thing and then reality showed you something else. And the conflict, then the resulting conflict created by that between your thinking and demonstrative reality has created a conflict that needs to be resolved before the person can move on from it. And it can be very easy, uh, or very difficult rather, for anyone to resolve it if they don't even know what cognitive dissonance even is, or if they even care about it. Suffice to say, progressives have a lot of this. So when you mention the, the historical ties between abortion and eugenics, 
and the reason why many people will abort, you will run into that cognitive dissonance response. And while I have very little experience in dealing with cognitive dissonance successfully, I will say that the best way to do it is to make yourself appear non-threatening because the the threat detection element of the human psyche is active and present in the situation. Like when a toddler throws a tantrum, it's because their threat mechanism is active and it's, or rather, overactive. Right? It's the same threat mechanism. How do you calm down a toddler having a tantrum? You try and relax them, you try and put them in a situation where their emotions will calm. By appearing non-threatening, maybe you'll say something funny or do something funny, you tell them a joke, right? The same works for babies. When babies cry, right, you, you make them laugh. You calm them down. You do something that is relaxing to them. And sadly, as, as infantilizing as this sounds, I'm not trying to infantilize. Uh, it same works with people of all ages. You eliminate, you eliminate any notion they have that you are dangerous or a threat to them by placating their emotions and calming them down saying, hey, hey, look, uh, hey, let me tell you this funny joke once. You see, um, a man walks into a bar, and he's got uh, his baby with him, and the baby's only a head, right? Isn't this funny? And he goes to the bar, and he's like, uh, hey, you know what? Uh, my son was born as just a head, and he's only got a few months to live. And uh, so maybe to, I want him to have some cool experiences before he has to die. So maybe we could just have a couple beers? And the barkeep's like, okay. So see, this is a funny joke. And you give the baby a beer, and suddenly, a body pops out. I was like, oh my god, this is awesome! My baby son's gonna be normal! Quick, give him more beer! And then he gets an arm. Then another beer, another arm. Another beer, another leg. And then finally one more beer to get that last leg, and then... The baby explodes. And the barkeep says, should've quit while he was ahead. <laughs> See, now we're laughing! We're laughing, we're telling out a disgusting joke. I tell that one, of course, because it's connected to this topic slightly. Uh, you don't start ab aborting babies with beer now. <laughs> but we tell the joke, and that calms the person down, and then we can resume the topic. Uh, if you'll give me a moment here. <clears throat> Maybe tell a joke that's slightly more tasteful, but I tend to like really dark, creepy jokes, and I apologize if that disturbed you in any capacity. Uh, let's tell a slightly more tasteful joke. Slightly more tasteful. What's long and hard and full of semen? A battleship, you pervert! <laughs> but anyway, uh, that's generally what's going to happen. Is you're going to run full steam into cognitive dissonance territory. And you're going to have to work with them to help them resolve it. Which, that's going to take practice, that's going to take time, that's going to take effort. But after a while, you have so many failures that you'll eventually figure out how to succeed. The most successful people in the world started out failing. That's how you learn to succeed, by failing. It's the ultimate teacher. And of course, we're going to get to some common abortion, anti-abortion pro-life arguments, such as um, the zygote's DNA is different from the mother, and that's absolutely correct. They've done DNA tests and DNA experiments, and they have found that the zygote's DNA is a compilation of DNA elements from the mother and the father, but ultimately it is different from the mother. Therefore, it is a different biological organism by the scientific definition. It is not the woman's body. It is the baby's body. It is the zygote's body. When you are, when you are aborting a baby, you are committing a murder, whether you realize it or not. Under legal definition, I think abortion should really only be, ever be uh, spoken of as a form of manslaughter. Right? It's a form of manslaughter. It is not third, second, or first degree murder, but it is definitely manslaughter. Because many of these people believe that it's not killing a life, even though it is. They've been indoctrinated into an ideology that, that dehumanizes and makes it seem like it's just a thing and not a living person. It makes it material, which is absolutely inhumane, completely disgusting, and totally abhorrent in every every conceivable fashion. But they, they go and they do it anyway. Because at the end of the day, they just want what they want, and they don't care how they get it. But the DNA is different from the mother. 
and as to how to regard or treat a woman who has had an abortion, I think she should be regarded, fundamentally speaking, as a person who has committed a manslaughter. That's how I think I should see it. That we should see it. You were guilty of manslaughter. You killed a living thing because you're selfish. Uh, we should not be cruel to the uh, the woman guilty of manslaughter of her own infant. We should not be cruel to her. And we should probably treat her with understanding. Maybe not kindness. You know, we need to be firm. We need to draw that line in the sand and we say, we need to say what you did was wrong. Right? But we are not going to be cruel. We're not necessarily going to be kind, but we are going to not to be going to be cruel. We are going to treat her as a person guilty of manslaughter of her own child. That's how I would see that. And whether you realize or not, you are participating in a eugenics uh, phenomenon. You are really participating in a eugenics-related activity. You are modifying the race to make it superior, whether you realize you're doing that or not. You are unwitting in the process because you have been tricked into doing it uh, by an ideo by a left-wing ideology that promotes the dehumanization of the unborn child. And whether or not that their act of eugenicists simply tricking you, or if they have some other agenda, who knows? There's still so much about what we don't know about the people who create and promote these ideas. We don't really know who came up with the idea of, oh, it's not a baby, it's pregnancy matter. Or who came up with the idea of, oh, it's not a baby, it's a, it's a clump of cells. We don't know who came up with these ideas, but whoever they are, they are disgusting, aberrant individuals, to be sure. And I would be highly suspicious that they are eugenicists tricking people into participating in eugenics. For one simple reason. Margaret Sanger, the founder of uh, Planned Parenthood, the primary abortion service provider in America, who was quoted as saying that she wanted to see people aborting black babies because they were black. Yes, she was a eugenicist. Now, there was a PolitiFact fact check on that point, but a friend of mine, or an associate, I should say, an acquaintance, we'll call him an acquaintance, uh, Vin of the YouTube channel Vin and Sori, I believe it was on his Middle America page, he more or less did a debunk of that and referred to it as politifarce. And that's the thing about these so-called fact checkers is that many of them, guess what? They're biased too, okay? <laughs> you can't just trust a fact checker just because they're called a fact checker. They will also have their biases. So who fact checks the fact checkers, right? You're basically engaging in a, in a rabbit hole and a, chicken, and a chicken or the egg. Who fact checks the fact checkers? I would say that you should just fact check news articles and news sources for yourself. I can do that because I have the basic skills I learned in a high school science class. Generally speaking, you want to make sure that if you look up an article, you want to take a part of the article title and put it in a search to see if there are any other corroborating articles, right? And if the articles are cloned, like they're exact same word for word, that's not really legitimate corroboration. And if there are any hyperlinks in the article, you want to look for, um, does this link to another site or does it link to the same site? Does it link to itself? If it links to itself, that's not legitimate corroboration. You got to check for corroboration. You got to want to look for photo and video embedded in the article. If they're decent or reasonable video clips. And video clips can be chopped up. I would say that pi uh, chopped up made to look bad or look good. I'd say pictures are probably the best, are probably the best uh, empirical evidence. But at the end of the day, I think most articles, if you just look at it and try and look for corroboration, and it's corroborated, then the source is probably good. Right? It's still secondhand information because you weren't really there, but it's just, it's the next best thing. So, with that being said, uh, <laughs> Thank you for watching. I don't care if I pissed anybody off. I'm just telling you the truth, whether you want to hear it or not. With that being said, there will be a link down below to my books. Please buy, download, and read them. And as always, uh, tschüss. Peace.